Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Jenna Biancaville. Oh, sorry, man, I even worked on the last name, Bianca Villa. Jenna, how are we doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me today, Gabriel. Yeah, I'm excited. She's the CEO of Pearl Capital Management. And the reason I'm actually excited about this one is because we're going to be talking a lot about finances, financial strategies for individuals, for business owners, for retirees. We're going to kind of get into all of it. But before we get into all of that, Jenna, please introduce yourself. Where are you calling in from? Give us a little background. Oh, I am in Phoenix, Arizona right now, um, but it's about to get pretty warm here in Phoenix. So um, I am newly a snowbird, or I guess if you leave Arizona, we we call it a sunbird, um, whatever. <laughs> I'm flocking to Michigan. So that starts next week uh, to get out of the heat and um, try leaving my team alone to run the business without me. So this is going to be my first year trying trying being in two states. Uh, throughout the year. Um, background, uh, you introduced me as the CEO. There's seven people on my team. So yeah, I have to run it all and wear all the hats. And I don't know if I always call myself a CEO because when we're when you're a small team, you give yourself a title. And I don't, I don't know when you earn CEO, but I don't know if it's at seven or 15 or 20 or 50 people. Uh, so I still have maybe a little imposter syndrome about, around that title, but boy, I'm wearing all the hats. <laughs> I love it. You know, I, I feel like it's kind of funny. Uh, people, again, it's a, just a title at the end of the day. But what, what it really truly is, is you are doing everything. You have you have your hands in all of the cookie jars. So tell us a little bit about Pearl Capital Management. What is it? So Pearl Capital Management is a, a completely independent boutique wealth management firm. So we're not... Um, affiliated, stuck with some big wirehouse that puts profits before people and tells us what we have to sell, which is, is pretty stinking cool that we get to be a fiduciary and put our clients first. Uh, and so we're we're considered a, a large trader or um, a large SEC registered firm. So we've got enough assets now to be playing with the big boys. But um, you know, as business owners, even though someone put the large sticker on us, I still feel like there's these just multi-billion dollar firms that are still the competition that we're competing against. Now, is this your first entrepreneurial endeavor? Um, ish. So, um, I did have, I guess I still have a, a branch of a lending company. Um, so there's, there's the branch thing, you know, when you take a franchise of what someone else built, it's easy. Uh, and then I was a partner in a firm before I launched my own firm. So I had, I had my experience in and around and doing all the hats before I jumped in. Um, and then since launching Pearl Capital and late 2015, early 2016. Um, I've also launched a couple other businesses. So uh, I've got a technology company now. I've got a, um, a masterclass that's launched. So once you're a serial entrepreneur or a multipreneur is this new term we're using, um, you can't really turn it off. I, I think I have a great business idea every single week and I have to remind myself, I don't have time for another business. It's a great idea. So I guess if any listeners want ideas, I'm not yeah. short on ideas. <laughs> I love it. Now let's talk about this transition because you, you kind of mentioned, you know, you were you were doing some work before you did it. We're in the lending work, working with a franchisee or a franchisor. Now you decided to create your own business. What what made you decide to what made you decide to go crazy and become an entrepreneur and start your own business on your own? Oh, especially in the highly regulated, huge barrier to entry finance world. I know exactly. Um, another, exactly. <laughs> you had to be kind of crazy, right? <laughs> Just a small amount. So I worked um, under a large broker dealer and a large firm, kind of ran with a, a branch with a partner uh, and was doing all the hats, but still had the structure and the compliance department, the legal department of the large firm. And I did that for seven or eight years and, and didn't really, like, I knew I wanted to continue to grow, but I didn't know I was going to open up my own business around that period of time. I didn't have all my ducks in a row, but what I did know was that I wanted to put my clients first and where I was at was no longer the place that I could put my clients first. Uh, Cause a lot of those big wirehouses, they're, they're profits first. Um, and 
I have to say, I, I don't blame them and we want them to stay that way because when we are investing, so I'm an investor, when we're investing, we want them to think about their shareholders and make sure that they're giving us profits as an investor in these companies. So it's what they're supposed to be doing. But from an advisor perspective, serving clients, it's really frustrating to, to be stuck in this conflict of interest area where the company you work for puts profits and shareholders first, but then you want to serve your clients first and you have to find a way to balance this. And it's, it's never perfect or equal. Uh, so I hated that. And I wanted to just serve the people I was promising that I was going to help them financially. Um, so I was switching from that company to a place that I thought I could do that. And I had already told my clients, we're leaving, we're going, we're going to go where there's greener pastures. And then six months in this process, as we're moving, they sold, they did some shady things. And I was in a oh crap moment of, I don't know who I can trust. I don't know where I can go. So it, it, it was a, an oh crap moment of, all right, can't trust anyone else. Might as well do this myself. Let's see what happens. And I didn't tell many people I started the business that first year. I was kind of in shock and also really busy and scared I'd fail. And, and so I had to get a year under my belt before I was like, okay, I'm doing this. I'm an entrepreneur. So we're like eight years in now. So now I, I fully identify as, as a business owner, but I did not have my ducks in a row, um, which is hard. I'm a planner. So to to say I didn't have a perfect plan is, was a tough spot for me. What would you say was the most valuable thing you learned during that first year when you're starting your business that has made you successful today? You know, someone said to me, it might have been at the tail end of the first year, starting the second year, um, no one's going to toot your horn, right? If you are going to say, I started a business or I'm doing a thing or I won an award, it's going to be you. You have to toot your own horn and make sure that you're telling people that you're doing this. Um, because I kind of had this like, I was an employee, right? I was a worker that like, then started a business, but just wanted to serve clients. And so I had my head down. I was serving clients. I was getting the work done. I had the website. And I thought like, oh, well, they'll just know that I do great work and they'll come to my website and hire me. And uh, the marketing part, the like, you need to tell people what you're up to part. I, I had to learn that one the hard way. And, and that was a good learning lesson for my first year. Now, one of the things you mentioned, you you were a fiduciary, Correct. Correct. So for the folks listening, a fiduciary is someone who manages money or property for someone else. So when you name a fiduciary, this individual accepts the role, but by law, they manage the person's money and property on the behalf of you. So again, this is what Jen is kind of getting at, is her goal is to really help the benefit of you, the individual. Now, you also mentioned kind of going through this process, there's a lot of a lot of paperwork to get into the fiduciary. Kind of talk us through that piece. What what did you have to, what are steps did you have to do to even start your business as a fiduciary? Well, and I'd like to further that definition, a little more clarification Please. there, because in financial planning, when we're housing money, we further say, legally, we must put the best interest of the client before our own, before the firm which is that big difference of working at a big wirehouse where you got to put the profits of the company first versus the true fiduciary if they define it and and people try to define it however they want but if you define it as put the client's interest above your own and above your firm's uh that's the place I really like to operate and that's my suggestion I might be a little biased but my suggestion to people is if you're hiring someone to manage your money ask them who the interests they're putting first yes uh at least, at least know what you're getting into. And if you're walking into a salesperson's office, know you're being sold, um, ask the questions. But um, as far as paperwork, gosh, this is, I, I could go into the weeds and really bore everyone. So I don't want to do that too much. <laughs> um, when people ask me how to get started in, in financial planning, and if they can start a registered investment advisory firm from scratch with no experience, I highly suggest not doing that and working at a firm first and seeing all the rules that you have to follow first, because if you, the SEC and FINRA and all the regulatory bodies that oversee us, ignorance is not an excuse. If you don't know the rules and you don't play by the rules, you're out of business and they take away your business in a moment's notice and they do it every single day or they fine you millions of dollars or worse. Um, you could go to jail. So uh, pretty high regulations. I'd really work in a firm and, and learn the rules first before opening a firm. 
And, and the rules are silly for the longest time we had, this just was less lifted like a year ago. We had a no testimonials. Um, so if someone went on Google reviews or Yelp reviews and wrote a testimonial, uh, the SEC was getting mad at us and saying, take that down. <laughs> we have no control over Yelp reviews, uh, but they had a no testimonials rule. And in every other business, that's that's the king of how to market yourself. And we had a rule against it. So there are silly rules sometimes as well. That is that is very interesting. And, you know, one of the things you, you're talking about, too, is as individuals, uh, when you're going to connect with a financial planner to kind of ask some various questions, what advice would you give to an individual when they are looking for a financial planner? What what should they be thinking about? What questions should they be asking? How How do they make sure they find the right fit? Oh, that's a great question. And I think interviewing and finding someone that serves your unique needs is so important. And there are financial professionals for every stage of life. And you're probably not going to have the same one through all stages of life. And so that's really painful for people when they outgrow the, you know, starter advisor that's at like the, the big name shop. And I'll, I'll try to not name drop the starter <laughs> advisors, but there's a lot of starter advisors and they help people save like $50 a month just to get started and get out of debt. And like, they get you going, but they're not going to be the person who has a tax efficient way to sell your business and a retire and tax efficient retirement strategy. So you don't run out of money in retirement. They're, they're just different skill sets. So you want to interview for exactly what you're looking for and make sure the person you're talking to is specialized in what you need. It, it, so I can't give the advice of this is what every listener should get in Instead, it's find someone who you identify with. It should be a longer-ish term relationship. So make sure you like the guy or girl. <laughs> Don't hire someone that you're going to avoid because you're paying them. So make sure you're going to want to call them and, and then also um, ask them how often you get to speak to them, um, how often you get to meet with them. Because if you want to see them quarterly, but they only offer yearly meetings, know that ahead of time. When, when you see a client, what are some of the, like the most common either mistakes or challenges that they seem to be dealing with or facing, or maybe the most common questions that they have for you? Um, so we are a place where most people graduate into, um, because we're that more boutique shop, we can do some high level planning. Also, I'm a, I'm a business owner, so I really attract business owners because we speak the same language. And, and the guy that's, you know, working at big name financial institution, he doesn't know what it's like to manage a staff and run payroll and, and actually run a business. And so uh, also the big companies usually aren't allowed to connect the dots and business owners want as much delegated as possible. So usually when they come to us, what they love is that we connect all the dots. So we have them sign a release. We talk to their CPA directly and we make sure that the, the financial plan and the tax plan are, have this smooth continuity. Most of our clients, their tax preparer just prepares taxes for one year. Maybe they'll talk about a, a two or three year plan. Um, we come in and do tax planning a little bit different. So we'll write a lifetime tax plan for a client and maybe even a multi-generational tax plan for a client if we think that we're, we're passing money down to the next generation or businesses. And then we hand this gigantic, you know, 40 year plan to the tax preparer and say, we might pay a little bit more money this year, but look at how this is going to save us over the lifetime. And so this is a long-term strategy, not a just lower it right now and shoot ourselves in the foot in the future strategy. So that's the number one thing people come to me for. Um, so I'm not saying it's the number one problem people have, but I have this niche where that's uh, what people are referred to me to help them with because there's not a lot of people doing lifetime tax projections. Now you you mentioned you know your your clients are primarily like that business owner kind of area. Now what would you what's kind of recommendations or or what what are the biggest things that business owners should be aware of when they're planning either to grow and scale or an exit strategy? A big thing they should be aware of is usually tax. Um, it's unfortunately going to eat away at, I don't know, up to 50% of what you're selling your business for. And you're you're thinking, yes, I'm selling my business for $20 million. This is great. And then you sit down and actually have someone do the math and you're like, 
oh, I get 10. And then after I pay my M&A guy and all of these things, I get nine and your, your big exit wasn't as big as you thought. And so there's, there's a lot of tax strategies you can put in place to not get that big hit all up front if you plan ahead of time and early. But if you wait till after the fact, uh, you, you just pay all the money in tax, you unfortunately. That, I think that's a great point. There's, there's a lot of hidden fees, a lot of things that folks don't re really take into consideration because we haven't gone down that path. Now, with that said, what are some tips? Because inflation's high right now, right? Mm -hmm. The cost of living is expensive and people are trying to figure out ways to save money. So what are some tips? What are the, what are the, some tips to make the most of our money? How, how, does, how can we budget a budget better? Ooh, actually one of my favorite tips, this, this isn't exactly budgeting, but I think any business owner who who's got some, some cash that's moving knows that you need to keep money in your checking account so that you can pay payroll bills, whatever's coming out, but it feels like dead cash, right? It's not being, it's not being utilized well. So a lot of banking institutions will will set up a sweep account for you where anything in excess of maybe, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 dollars, whatever you want to keep in your account, a hundred thousand dollars depending on what you're spending daily, um, it'll sweep up to a money market. And so you can get be getting paid five percent on your operating account. And then every day it sweeps back down and every night it sweeps back up. So you get that five percent money market sweep on your operating account. So yeah, we talk about in inflation and interest rates being bad, but we can also use these to our advantage if we just set up the right types of accounts with our banking institutions. So that would be a great tip. Call your banker, ask if they can implement a sweep account for you. Man, that is an awesome, awesome idea. You know, I never really actually thought about that. And you know, one thing I've actually, my wife's worst subject to talk to me about is always retirement. I'm always asking, I'm always like, hey, this is where I'm at retirement. This is where I'm going. Because my biggest fear, you know, you're kind of talking about building and scaling and saving money, but my biggest fear is running out of retirement savings. So how how do I ensure to not outlive my retirement savings? Well, it's the same way that you budget while you're working. You you know what your inflows are and you know what your outflows are um, and you make sure you're living within your means. However, inflows, your income, it's not coming from your job anymore. It's coming from your pensions, your social security, your savings. And so you need to calculate out what your, what your new retirement paycheck is going to be. Uh, easy math is you can look up a kind of a, a financial rule. It's called the 4% rule. This is kind of a very basic concept of you can roughly live off of about 4% of what you have saved for retirement. If you're retiring around 65 and roughly, hopefully not run out of money. I, I can't do any guarantees without knowing are people investing? Because if you're investing the money in something that's losing money, this 4% rule is not really going to work for you. Uh, but that's a um, kind of a tried and true strategy and something for you to just do a calculation on your own. Am I going to run out of money? Can I live off of 4% of the assets um, in addition to, you know, social security pensions, whatever other guaranteed income you might ha be, ha have coming in. Uh, and if you can live off of that, then you've saved enough. Yes. And, and your investments are, are right, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's investing, investing in a sound strategies, making sure to diversify your investments is always is something I always encourage. I'm not a financial planner or anything, but I, I do encourage uh, looking at different ways and talking to individuals like Jenna, who know much more than me uh, in the financial world. Um, now, one of the things you talked about is you, you work, you're primarily focused, right? You're with business owners. Uh, you also mentioned the SEC does not allow these, you know, we're, they're these testimonials, which I got to say, folks, that's really the bread and butter of how to start a business is you you amplify your testimonials and you say hey this is this is the the work I've done here's uh here's a proof of it how did you build your brand when you have so much uh limitations because of the SEC oh it is um, like the movies where they're navigating in the lasers, like trying to... <laughs> like, don't trip a laser, follow the rules, stay within bounds. Um, I'm a rule follower. So, um, I'm just really lucky that I somehow have entrepreneur gene and rule follower gene. Cause <laughs> usually these two doesn't, things doesn't usually happen that way. do not happen. Um, <laughs> uh, but in this industry, 
I, you don't want to be breaking rules. Um, and some of them feel silly because every single regulator that gets elected wants to say, I'm regulating Wall Street. It's it's somehow like the elect me cry. And then they get there and they're like, they have so many rules. What can I make up? Right. They're like, I can't even think of what new rules they can come up with. Uh, but they do. And then we have to figure out how to follow the next year's net next legislators new set of rules. Um, but how I built the business, it was a lot of in-person networking. It was a lot of get out and meet people and shake hands and show them that I know what I'm talking about. Uh, I think originally when I was young in the business, because I started, I started the business at 29. You're not supposed to start a financial planning business as a 29 year old female. Um, the, the industry says no, all the movies tell you, it, we all know what the advisor looks like in the movies. He, he doesn't look like me. Um, and so I needed to like show someone face to face. I'm smart. I know what I'm talking about. I use technology. I'm with the times. I have more relevant recent strategies than the guy who's obsolete. And yeah, he looks like the guy in the movies, but he doesn't even have, like, he still wants you to fax your documents to him. <laughs> so showing them that sometimes experience doesn't always equal better and that you might get better value out of someone who's a little different and the other half of it was me accepting that I wasn't a good fit for everyone. Some people wanted that old school advisor that it looks like they have in the movies and just me coming to peace with, I'm not a good fit for everyone, but the people I'm a good fit for, I'm going to provide tremendous value for. You know, it's interesting you mentioned the good fit piece because you you kind of stated how you organically noticed uh, the individual kind of financial planners, not my area of focus, but my real customer is the business owner. What and you you also kind of as you mentioned you worked previously in this kind of world. What was what would what was kind of like the easy part for you, or or has there been any easy part for you in the transition of saying you know what now I have my niche I know who my people are. Has there been anything that kind of came relatively easy, or or what is the most enjoyable piece about that transition? Um. Well, I can't say that I've fully transitioned. Um, I, I, I gotta be honest. I, I wish I was better at fully defining my niche and just saying, I only work with business owners, but I have a lot of individual households that I still work with and I still love. And if I had, um, I don't know, I, I get a lot of women who are a divorcee or a widow that come into my office and are just like, you know, these, these people are so condescending. I just want someone to speak to me in not finance terms. And I still love educating and I still love taking those clients. So I am not following every single business book I've ever read that said, find a niche and stick with it. I still keep things a little broader. I probably should sit down with a business coach and get slapped over the head for this one. <laughs> so that's not the right answer. I know it. No, I actually, I actually enjoy that. You know, one of the things we did, we started nonprofits, the business accelerator in a program, and we decided to go business agnostic. Uh, and the reason we did that is because what we realized during the accelerator piece in particular is it kind of removes the, uh, removes the competition away from it. Because when you have a business accelerator, you just focus on the same niche. Uh, it it kind of gets a little competitive, but I do like the diversification within different uh, industries because it allows you also to expand your knowledge beyond just the business owner perspective, because certainly don't get me wrong, being an entrepreneur, you have a lot of different, you know, uh, things like you mentioned, a lot of rules that we must follow, but the household rules uh, the household sometimes doesn't have doesn't follow the same rules as the business owner. So, with that said, what are some of the difficulties of starting this business? The difficulties of getting it started, or the difficulties of working with a lot of different types of clients. Let's do both. Let's, okay. let's start with the uh, starting out your business. What has been difficult about starting out the business? You know, I have to say, I went through all of the entrepreneurial struggles that you read in the business books. So when I was working with a team, right before I started Pearl Capital, um, I hired, fired, managed, trained, and ran my own client book of business. And, you know, it was like a team of revolving door of 20 people that we, no one stuck. So I was always training, managing. 
And when I started Pearl Capital, I was like, well, I don't want to do that again. That was terrible. I'm going to figure <laughs> out how to get all of the right third-party businesses to put this together. So I don't have to do that, um, which we all know, like you need to hire your first employee. You need to have a growth plan. You need to have a scale plan. So uh, didn't do that for the first couple of years, finally accepted that I was going to hire again, waited too long, didn't hire soon enough. So like all the the same stories we all go through where we, we have to get to that next level. Um, originally built the business around me as, you know, the advisor and then had my admin team to support me and then, you know, got the next gut punch. You don't have a business. You just created a job for yourself. Like <laughs> it won't run if you're not giving advice. So, okay, go to the next level, hire other me's who are also giving advice, who I can really take a vacation and take a day off. And so I, I've had like the, the very, very quintessential expected entrepreneur journey where I waited too long to do the next thing that the business book told you to do. Uh, so I, I wish I would have just read the book and listened to the advice or listened to a podcast and, and like did the thing, but I had to, I'm, I guess I'm stubborn. I had to learn the hard way on some of those. But I think that's the point is you learned. I mean, I, I think I, I am growing. We're yeah, here. You didn't stop. I think that's the biggest thing about entrepreneurship is is it's not easy, and sometimes you're going to have those gut punches, uh, but it's about persevering to continue on, right? And it's just continuing to move forward. Now, the next one you mentioned, what what were what were what would you say are some of the difficulties working with, uh, you know, I very non niched uh, clientele. Um, I I do feel like people fit a mold where they come with high level problems. I love the the complex real life math puzzle that is every individual situation. Um, so the similarity is most people who come to me are complex, which is fun. Um, I don't get a lot of like easy, easy financial plans. And, and if I did, I'd probably hand them to um, one of my team members because I love problem solving. Uh, I like puzzles. I think I'm kind of spreadsheet puzzle nerd, I, which is usually also not a trait of a, an it, entrepreneur. So. I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd. I get, I love the data. <laughs> yeah. So um, with that, I, I think there, there is a blueprint that I get, which is complex problems and they don't know who can solve them. So they, they come to be solved here or just unorganized. They need someone to like pull it all together, organize it, get a better plan in place. Yeah. That's me. It, it just That's feels me. like chaos and, and you want it to feel like a, a real plan. Uh, and also business owners, I don't only serve the business. I'm not just a business financial advisor. They're humans, individuals, families with, yes. you know, their spouse and their kids and they bring their personal problems. So there's a lot of overlap. And usually my business owners, the goal is, sell the business, have an exit, retire, and and then they turn into um, <laughs> recovering business owners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. Never, you're kind of, I feel like even though you sell your business, as you were mentioning, Jenna, you're always an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You're constantly. Yeah. Now let's kind of go through, because you mentioned you do see a lot of diverse uh, clientele. So mm -hmm. let's let's kind of go through some advice for various stages. Let's say, for example, what advice would you give for an individual, just young individual coming like the 15-year-old to 20-year-old? They're just kind of getting into the career. Maybe they're thinking about starting their own business. Um, they're just starting to bring in a paycheck. What are some things that they should be thinking at a, at a young age to help support them for generational wealth when they're later on in life? Um, the, the first thing, and this is good advice for everyone, but really for young people is lifestyle creep is a thing. And so you think, oh, I'm, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm barely getting by. My salary is really low. Cause I'm just getting started. I'll make money, more money later next year, the year after I'll, I'll get a bonus next year. And so I'll just spend all of my paycheck now. And then I'll figure out how to save next year. And so this next year is something that people will do for their whole entire life is just keep kicking that next year. Okay, next year, things will be better. Next year, things will be easier. And it's never easier. Inflation happens, lifestyle creep happens, businesses happen, you spend more and you spend more and you spend more and then you have kids and they go to college and they get more expensive and all the things. So it's just save a percentage of your income. And it doesn't matter if it's 
10, 20% of a $30,000 income or 10 or 20% of a $100,000 income, save a percentage of your income and stop trying to think about, I can save X amount of dollars when I make more dollars. Put in percentages. Um, the other thing you want to know is um, if we're saving for retirement, Roth IRA, you pay tax now. Traditional IRA, you pay tax later. So you don't pay tax now. Um, so those, those are our two buckets. You can also do this with Roth 401k, traditional 401k, same concept. Um, we like Roth when our tax brackets are low. So if you think this is a low earning year for me and I have a lot of upward projections and I don't imagine being back in this low tax bracket, pay the tax now, get it in a Roth, never pay tax again. So when you're in a higher tax bracket, you don't have, have to pay tax. And then the exact opposite, if you're in a really high bracket, high earning year, um, you can maybe not pay tax now. And then if in your retirement, you're making less money, pay tax then. Um, that assumes our tax brackets don't change. So if the government changes our brackets, then that's terrible advice. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of assumptions in there. I mean, granted, the last time they it took several years for them to change the tax bracket. So hopefully one's not coming in any time, any time soon. Now, one of the things you also mentioned was savings. And I, I believe that savings is really important uh, no matter who you are. What what are some saving avenues individuals should be exploring outside of the typical banking savings? Because I think everybody knows about a savings account with a banking, but I'm not sure if everybody knows that there are other saving avenues. What are those? Ooh, so for savings, I mentioned that sweep account for business owners that that goes up to a, a money market. And I did mention that money markets are paying about 5% right now. That's that's a current number. Um, so we're in 2024, um, coming into the summer of 24. So uh, that's not always going to be the case. So I, I'm supposed to make little <laughs> caveats and disclaimers like when I say percentage rate of returns. Um, but money markets or high yield savings accounts are paying a lot of money right now. So um, for people who are listening now and getting this advice now, uh, uh, make sure your money's not stuck in large bank institution savings account earning less than 1%. Um, I personally have my high yield savings account over at American Express. Um, it's a big bank. So there's the, the security there and the, it's a great high yield interest rate. No, no minimums, no fees. Um, it's been great. And I have no affiliation with American Express. So um, if someone wants to call me for an affiliate link, I'll happily take it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, totally. Exactly. In fact, you know, the beauty of that, in fact, go ahead and send me that. I'll put it on the newsletter, which is a great time to plug the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter, folks. You can uh, subscribe at the shades of e com. So please do that. And, the, the, you know, the interesting thing about, uh, you know, as you continue to grow, especially I think I read this recently on CNBC News, I think it's like 89% of Americans actually do not have a high yield savings account. Uh, that's that's really when you think about letting you know, people talk about um, making your money work for you. That's essentially what a high yield savings account or a money market does, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You put it in there and you'll gain interest. Sure, there's some certain risk with the money market at times, but if you look kind of, I would say my personal experience when I'm looking at the stock market and I look at 30 years, so the time frame, because that's about how long it's going to take me to retire. It hasn't lost money in a 30 year time frame. So I kind of generally assume, yes, it's a bit of a risk, but if I keep it in there for long enough, I will see a return on my uh, investment. And so again, it's just another way to think about it. Now, what advice, let's say, let's talk about the retiree. Somebody's somebody's a little bit now um, further along in their career and they're getting ready to retire. What are some things retirees should be thinking about before they go ahead and, and say, you know what, I'm ready to retire? And I, I keep talking about tax, um, <laughs> but, I, the, <laughs> but the answer is think about taxes. Um, so a lot of people don't know that money that we saved in the traditional 401k, in the traditional IRA that we haven't paid tax on yet. When you hit your mid seventies, there's something called required minimum distribution or RMDs. And so the government forces you to take a certain percentage out of that account and forces you to pay tax, whether you need it or want to spend it or not. And so a lot of retirees don't know this and they you know, continue to save all of their money in this 
pre-tax account and then they hit their mid seventies and they're just like, how am I in the highest tax bracket I've ever been in my life while I'm retired? I don't need to spend this much money. This wasn't the plan. And so knowing about required minimum distributions, having a plan ahead of time, and usually what that looks like is retiring from your job, not taking your pension or social security or something for a gap year or a couple gap years, and maybe doing some Roth conversions and getting some of that money that you haven't paid tax on yet in your IRA over to that Roth, or even just, just start pulling it out, pay the taxes. And then you can start taking your social security pensions, things like that later. And you get a larger amount because the, the amount of your social security you get is taxed based on how much your income is. So if you're pulling money out of your IRA, then the amount of social security goes down because more of it's taxed. Um, and so there's just all of this stuff that's really intricate. If you do a really long multi-year plan, you can see it. Um, if you're just focusing one year at a time, all of a sudden you hit mid mid seventies and you're like, what is RMD? This sucks. Yeah. Um, so that is a, a really important thing to know about as a retiree. You know, you gotta, I gotta tell you, Jenny, you just reminded me of something. You just reminded me of how little I know about the financial world and how much I need my own financial planner. I swear, because folks, again, this, the, the beauty of it is, is there are a lot of people out there that are so much more smarter than us that are in these worlds um, that that really understand what it means to create generational wealth. I mean, a lot of this podcast is focused on helping educate people to one, be successful in the entrepreneurial journey, but also to build and establish generational wealth, right? Because that's, that's the goal. I have two young girls and that's really my goal is to build that generational wealth. So Jenna, People are interested that you you got them talking about you. They really like what you're doing. How do they contact you? What if they're interested in hiring you for the their financial planning services? How can they get a hold of you? Oh, I have a scheduling link. It's schedulejenna.com. You can just jump into my calendar. Um, but that might fill up quickly if there's no meetings available, because I just said this out loud. <laughs> um, um, you can email the team, which is email at the pearlcapital.com. And we can put that in your show notes. Um, you can just email the team and request a meeting with us. I do, I call it my free mini plan. Uh, I removed the free consultation because it's it's not a sales conversation. I actually give actionable mini financial planning advice right there in the meeting. And I tell them, if I were you, I do this, 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 this. Now they know how I give advice, the type of advice I want to give, if they even need me, because someone who's a do-it-yourselfer and is just like, I got it, I'm going to implement it, don't need you anymore. That's a great first meeting. Everyone feels like it was a good use of their time. They're probably going to go refer me because they're like, hey, this, this girl gives away free advice. Um, usually at least turns into a referral. Um, but for the people who are, are just saying, I don't want to do this. I want to trust you to help me with it. Those are the people I want to work with anyways. And they know how I give advice. So that's why I do kind of a non-sales free mini plan. So it's a, a pretty um, value add experience for reaching out for the first time. Excellent. And I, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm selfish, uh, folks. Uh, I'm going to be able to use this link before this is airs because I am definitely getting, I'm sliding into Jenna's DMs as quickly as possible because again, the amount of knowledge, this thing's just, just that 70 year old thing that the, um, you mentioned the taking out amount of the distributions at the age of mid seventies. I did not know that. So I'm like, oh, oh, that is very interesting. And I'm in a very unique position where I work for a nonprofit. So I do have a pension, but I also have a 401k and a 403 and a 457. And I'm also putting in money into my uh, IRA. So Jenna, we're going to, we're going to get on the books and we're going to have a conversation because I'm very interested now. Now, again, what other kind of things kind of, I don't think, I think we kind of missed the business owner advice and I would love to kind of loop back around to that. What for a business owner that is a, either about to sell or exit their business, what advice would you give them? I, you just want some consultants on this. Having, I think having the right consultants around you. So someone who can help you prep the business for sale. So you can really start planning this five years in advance. That's ideal because most of us are not operating at premium efficiency to be sell selling the business at top dollar. So you can have that advice. It'll usually almost always pay for itself. 
um, having the, the plan on what you're doing with the proceeds of the sale of your business before you enter into that contract. Um, because if it's multi-generational, you want a dynasty, you want this money to last beyond you, beyond your children. Um, we have some awesome tax efficient things that we can put in place if that's the goal. If the goal is this is just for me and my retirement, I'm not taking care of anyone else. There's other tax efficient ways to do it, but you need to know what your plan is um, and then ask someone what's the what's the best way to implement this plan ahead of time. Because once you sign the, the dotted line and you get the check, um, you just pay the tax and you, you don't have any of those strategies available to you anymore. So uh, like anything, ask questions ahead of time. Don't ask for forgiveness afterwards because the IRS isn't very forgiving. <laughs> that is very true. And folks, I got to tell you, you know, Jenny, you, you made a really good point. Planning your exit for business owners, planning your exit at the beginning is very important because usually an exit occurs because of a, a life stage event occurred, right? Um, either the pandemic happened or somebody came and had an offer you cannot refuse, even though you weren't planning to sell, uh, or maybe, you know, you caught an illness, you know, something that occurs in life tends to kind of push the, the business towards that exit. Um, and so just, just being prepared for that is very, very important. I really like your, your answer of just asking questions. You know, getting there and asking questions, you know, you mentioned as you started, you just got out there and networked and, and built your relationships that way. And that's, that's really how you built your business. And I can't tell you enough, folks, getting out and networking, building, uh, connecting with other people, asking questions, uh, understand, having a humble approach uh, to business is very important to understanding that we don't know everything, right? Uh, I, I try to tell my wife, I know everything. She doesn't believe me still, but we'll get there one day. But, you know, just, just having, having the humbleness to ask the questions and truly taking the feedback is very, very important. Now, Jenna, is there any last words you'd like to tell the listeners? Well, you mentioned, you know, the pandemic or a health event or, and things that happen to us that we can't foresee as business owners, which obstacles happen. I, I love Ryan Holiday's obstacle is the way if if you're, anyone's a reader here. Um, but I, as a financial planner, I feel like too many of my business owners are not saving enough for themselves. They're not paying themselves enough because we as business owners know the ROI on our money. If I take this money and put it back in my business, I know exactly what I'm getting out of it versus ROI on stock market, on real estate investments, on things that are like, I don't understand and I don't have control over. We don't like that. So we don't like paying ourselves and putting in something we don't have control over. We like just pumping it right back into the business, which for so many business owners um, ends up being a catastrophe if like one obstacle happens that we couldn't have foreseen like a global pandemic, which a lot of people didn't see coming. So um, that's a, a, a last piece of advice is pay yourself what you're worth, take some money out of the business, hold it for yourself, um, for your future, for your children, for a rainy day, for that unforeseen obstacle that we can't predict. Well, well said. Jenna Bianca Villa, I'm going to say it, CEO of Pearl Capital Management, <laughs> even though she's still struggling with that. Uh, thank you again so very much. Uh, I think a lot of great advice. Again, folks that are interested, her information will be on the newsletter the week before the episode airs, the week the episode airs, and the week the after the episode airs. So you can subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter by visiting theshadesofe.com. You can also follow us on the social sites, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and TikTok at the Shades of E, where there will be reels of Jenna in our conversation. And then you can also stream this entire conversation on your podcast or on YouTube. Jenna, again, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Uh, enjoy your time out uh, in Michigan as the new uh, new resident over there. I'm surprised you didn't want to go to Michigan during the winter. I hear it's just phenomenal out there. Maybe a little <laughs> in Phoenix, I guess. Well, again, I thank you again so much for folks listening. Thank you and have a great night.